That's the crowd. I don't know if I'll find anybody to do that. Okay. Stand if you're able and let's raise our voices and praise to God as the light of Christ enters our worship. Here in this place, the new light is streaming. Now is the darkness vanished away. See in this space, our fears and our dreamings. Lord, here to you by the light of this day. Gather us in the lost and forsaken. Gather us in blind and the lame call to us now and we shall awaken we shall arise at the sound of our name Excellent. There's one missing lyric that we needed to add today. Gather us in the cold and the freezing. We are here to light ourselves by the warmth of God's grace. Welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church. Before you sit down, though, I, you know what I'm about to say. Uh, I need you all to move up. There is no, you know, don't worry about being in the back row today. You made it here. Come on down. We are so pleased to have you all here, and I imagine we're having a, a much larger crowd crowd this morning live streaming with us, uh, so welcome, uh, and what I'd ask is go ahead and register your attendance with us on the registration tab that you'll find at the end of the, each of the pews, and if you're watching on live stream, whether you're watching it live or you're watching it later in the day or the week, uh, in the little chat area, just let us know you're here. Say who you are and welcome. You may be seated, by the way. I forgot to tell you that. Today is hat day. I see many of you remembered that. That's wonderful. There are some wonderful hats. I tell you, every Sunday, every year when we celebrate hat day, I actually do see Darlene in the back of our sanctuary. I have to do, if I do a double take at some point in the service, that's what's happening. Uh, it's, to, it's, it's amazing. Uh, just a couple of announcements to let you know about. Uh, fortunately, this Sunday was not the Wolf Pack uh, bake sale. That's next Sunday. So next Sunday, be sure to bring some money with you uh, because you will be sorry if you don't. There will be lots of homemade baked goods, and we'd like you to leave full and happy next week. So... Bring some money to help support the Wolfpack Special Olympics team. That is a team that we uh, just love to support here at Westminster. They mean a lot to a lot of people here. And then next Saturday, the White Spruce Chamber Players have a concert. That would include Brett and Laura are in that group. Uh, they have a concert at Poplar's Music at 2 o'clock on Saturday. Put that on your calendar because you might forget if you try to remember from now until then. You don't want to miss that. That is wonderful music. And I'm, again, I'm glad it was next week and not this week. Uh, Wednesday Church Alive will be taking place, weather permitting, this Wednesday. I sure hope it will be. We'll have all the activities going. The adult Bible study, uh, since we missed last week, we will still do chapter two this week. So I just wanted you to make sure you knew that. If there are no other announcements to be made, I hope it's all right that you see me in, a, in this hat all day, but it is Hat Sunday, and I figured on a cold, wintry day, this is the kind of hat to wear. Uh, that, and I had to wear it earlier today when I was snow blowing my uh, uh, driveway, and so my hair's a mess anyhow. If there are no announcements to be made. Let's call ourselves to worship. The word of God is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. 
Jesus fulfills the scriptures. Therefore, treat people in the same way you want people to treat you. Stand if you are able and let's sing together how firm a foundation. It is hymn number 361 and we will sing the first two verses. During the season of Epiphany, we come to recognize that Jesus is the Word of God. The Word of God embodied here on earth. So we can see what it looks like living. And what do we see? We see Jesus again and again and again forgiving. Even from the cross, he speaks words of forgiveness. So we come before God now in the grace of Jesus Christ, knowing that God forgives so we can trust and confess our sins. Oh, Lord. God of mystery and wonder, we bring our doubts to you. We confess that all too often we have allowed doubt to overcome faith. We have turned away when our questions become too hard or too painful. We have preferred easier, smaller imitations of the truth to the life and faith you desire for us. We have sought refuge in certainty. Forgive us, we pray. Lead us to a heartfelt belief that is unafraid of doubt, that welcomes mystery, that trusts in you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Oh, Lord, hear my prayer. Oh, Lord, hear my prayer. When I call, answer me. Even on an amazingly cold, bitter, blizzardy day, we've got great news. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world 
without end. Amen. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 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 May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I invite you to pass the peace with one another. And I think today you could probably pass the peace with everybody who's here. There's one brave child here who agreed to come down with me this morning. So we're going to do the children's sermon, just the two of us. All right. So tell me, Grace, do you have a favorite story? You like all stories. Good for you. I'm kind of like that, too. Are you familiar with the story of the Lion King? Yeah? Yeah. One thing about the Lion King is it's called, you know, they sing that song, The Circle of Life, because they show how it really is on the, the plains of Africa and how the um, animals eat each other and fight each other and, you know, all that stuff, yeah. And so, but in the story of the Lion King, which has beautiful music and beautiful characters and, you know, it's just so feel good, there's also some stress, isn't there? There's some dark parts where Scar, you know, the awful uncle, sets up Simba to think that he actually was responsible for his dad's death. And you just hurt for that, and Simba gets so scared he runs away. And, and it's just, it's really hard sometimes in the story to read the dark part, isn't it? Yeah, you kind of would like to be able to skip that part. And yet that's kind of real life to animals, isn't it? Like the hyenas are mean. And in real life, hyenas are mean. And so stories sometimes, although they're dark, have, have good lessons in them. And did you know that's true of the Bible? Did you? Okay, good. Because the Bible, ultimately the Bible is about God loving you, loving you more than anything and wanting you to be in relationship with him. That's the message of all this. But the Bible is really kind of a library. Did you know there are 66 books in the library? Yeah, actually, yes, I did know that. Did you? Good for you. And there were 40 different authors, and 5 billion copies of the Bible have been printed. Yep, and that's more, that is more than any other book ever. And by a long shot, by the way, it's way out in, ahead of that. So the Bible is, is, we often refer to it as the word. It's God's word. And although God didn't dictate the Bible, they say that God breathed into the Bible. So he breathed into the authors to set their hearts right to write what they were going to write. But I want to show you something. Years ago, my grandma died, and my aunt moved into her house. And then when my aunt died, my mom and I went to her house to, you know, we could take out things that the family wanted to keep. Well, I found this. <laughs> this is really strange. This says, for God and country, greetings to the one in the service. 
And this was sent to a man, I believe it was a man, I have no idea really, who was in World War II. And it says, from Uncle Bert and Aunt Mabel, who I have no idea who they are, but they sent this to, I'm assuming, their nephew, could have been a niece. Well, isn't it? Now listen to this. Inside in this teeny little font, I can read it barely too. It says, this little book attached to this card is the world's smallest Bible, contain containing over 200 pages of the New Testament and the Lord's Prayer. Every word, now get this, <laughs> can be read with good eyesight or a magnifying glass. <laughs> now look at this. Now you tell me. Good for you. I did read the first part, so even though I didn't put extra commas. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, what it is, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Every page in the world's smallest font before font was even a word. Tiny. Isn't that tiny? So, do you think this Bible did the soldier much good? Excellent. Do you think it did? It's better. End of story. <laughs> Very good. You did End that perfectly. Story. End, of story. End of story. End of story. So really, this Bible was sent lovingly to this soldier, even though the soldier wasn't going to be able to sit and read it and enjoy it. I mean, I mean, look, it's practically impossible to see. But still, it was given with love, right? And that's the most important. It was like this aunt and uncle saying to their nephew, here's God's love to be with you during this war-torn time in our country. Well, then I was lucky enough when I was about, I don't know, five or six, my grandma gave me this. That, 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 that's just a little bit better. Isn't it's it? a little bit better. And I can actually read this yeah, one. Yeah, that's a lot better. I know. And this one even has, it has pictures. It has pictures. Yeah, little black and white pictures. And in this little Bible, and it says, has my name in it from Nana, that's what I called her. And this Bible has one or two verses from every book in the Bible, plus the Lord's Prayer and a couple of little things. But look at this, notes. <laughs> you want to keep notes in your book. <laughs> but again, this book, I think I was given this before I could read. And so it really was also like an introduction to the Bible. Here's a little Bible you can put in your pocket. It says it on the title. It says yes. It on the, the, little Bible. the little Bible. And also given to me lovingly from a grandma who wanted me to read the Bible eventually. And it's an important book to remember. And there's Bibles for all ages, all reading skills. There's five billion of them. So everybody can find a copy of God's love letter to you. It would be tiny enough for a bird wedding. You're right. Yep. Okay, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for the Bible that we can hold close to us, can read, can study, can take into our hearts at any time we want to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming down, Grace. <laughs> thank you. Lilith's Bible later, let me know. <laughs> that was the craziest thing I've ever seen. That's, that's awesome. Can you imagine trying to underline one of the verses? In that? Yeah. Just, what, what would you use? <laughs> well, as we come to hear this word, uh, the scripture this morning, let's first come to God in prayer. Dear God, we ask that you would just open our hearts and our minds to the word that you would have for us today, wherever we're at, whether we're here or whether we're watching this online, that your word would speak to us and change us, transforming us who you create us to be. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first scripture this morning comes from the Psalms, chapter, from chapter 119. 
Uh, that is the longest chapter in the entirety of the Bible. It's a long one. Uh, so when I say verses 103 to 105, I'm not even probably midway through it. Uh, but we're going to read those, two, those three verses. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your uh, precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading this morning comes from 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, and I, I will be reading verses 16 through 17. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. Once I heard a pastor in Texas give a sermon about how the Bible um, was not kid-friendly. Basically, he was saying in his sermon that if you're not in high school... It's not appropriate for you to be reading the Bible. Now, I was confused because I love this pastor and I knew his church and I knew they handed uh, Bibles out to their third graders. I, I knew his wife taught the fourth and fifth graders for decades and I knew she taught them about the Bible and they were reading the Bible in that class. But I understood what he was saying. He made some good points. It, he wasn't going to practice what he preached that Sunday. The church was going to encourage their kids to read the Bible. But what he was saying was this. If you give someone the Bible, they just might read it. All of it. Even the parts you don't want them to read. Especially when you give them to kids. They're going to find those parts. I remember when I was a kid... Uh, uh, we used to pass uh, share poetry with the girls from the Song of Solomon. Oh, dear. oh, I know. You know, that is not PG rated. No. And I was reminded of exactly this a few weeks ago in our confirmation class when, when I had them uh, read the part, uh, the story about Elijah when he faced King Ahab, right? And, and King Ahab had 450 prophets of Baal. And, and they were going to have a showdown. And all of Israel showed up. And, 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 and the combat basically was which God would light the altar on fire. And Elijah even let the, the prophets of Baal have the first chance. And they tried for hours and hours and hours and nothing happened. And then Elijah just quickly prays to God and Boom! The fire comes down, incinerates everything. And here is Elijah telling the Israelites, you've got to get off the fence. Who are you going to serve? It's a great confirmation story, right? And I had them stop reading, right? When the fire came down, incinerated everything. It's a great ending. But the kids kept reading. And you know what verses come right after that? Yep. Julie, if you didn't hear, Julie said, kill every." Elijah commands them, round up every last prophet of Baal, kill them all. It's a bloodshed. And so the, the kids rightly asked, is this how a prophet of God should act? Is this what that passage in 2 Timothy is referring to as, a, as inspired? Part of the reasoning the, the pastor in Texas was giving this sermon uh, was not only about the parts in the Bible that you don't want your kids to read that are R-rated or, or NR-rated or actually MA. There's some passages in there might even get an X rating. If they made a movie out of it, definitely would. But more than that, what this pastor was saying is it is complicated, complex reading. Are the kids ready 
to dis- make the discernment when they come to passages like this. Are you ready? Actually, he was preaching to the adults. He's using the kids as an excuse, but he was practicing, he was preaching to the adults. Are you able, ready to make those, to discern, to be, to read the Bible beyond a kid level reading? Because let's be honest, reading the Bible is not an easy book to read. And like Linda said in the children's sermon, it's not even a book. Okay? The word Bible means books, library. It is a library, a sacred library. Our sacred library contains 66 books. Not everybody, by the way, has the same sacred library. Okay? Uh, and that sacred library is made up of, like all libraries, lots of different authors over a lot of different time period writing a lot of different genres. There's wisdom literature, there's poetry, uh, uh, there's short stories, there's letters, there's gospels, not biographies, gospels, there's a difference. Uh, There's apocalyptic literature, which was a real big popular style at some times uh, in, in, in history. So we come to this library and we take out a book, and there's some violence in it. Violence done by prophets of God. Violence done seemingly by, by God. And not just over an individual, but over groups of people, including children. What do we do with that? Or... You've heard people say, I'm sure many of you have probably said at one time or another, you can make the Bible justify just about anything. People can make an argument using the Bible over anything. You just pick a verse here, pick a verse there, pick a verse there. I I remember in seminary, we we had to read a a book uh, titled Slavery, Sabbath, War, and Women. And in that book, I read uh, sermons by written by southern pastors prior to the Civil War, and they were, you know, picking verses here and here and here, uh, and they were able to make very persuasive arguments that made it sound like God ordained, not not just ordained, that God created slavery for our benefit. It's that type of interpretation. Uh, It's those kinds of hard passages that make people start to doubt. To doubt the relevancy of the Bible. Is it relevant to us anymore? To doubt their faith. Do uh, Do we echo the words of the psalmist? How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Do we say that? Do we live out that the word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path? Do we read the Bible? Biblical illiteracy is a major problem growing right now in the United States. And and, like Linda said, there's been five billion copies. It's not a, not a problem of people not having the Bible. The problem is people tend to use it as a paperweight, not read the Bible. They make arguments from the Bible without ever knowing what's in the Bible because they're not reading it. There was one researcher who did a study on, on uh, people and reading of the Bible and, and found out that Americans, they revere the Bible revere the Bible. They just don't read it. His research showed that most most people in the U.S. can't even name a couple of Jesus' disciples. Over 60% cannot, cannot come up with five of the Ten Commandments. No wonder we break them. Uh, 81% 
believe that the Bible teaches the primary purpose in life is to take care of one's family. 81%. Now, taking care of one's family is not a bad thing. It's just not the primary thing that the Bible teaches. 12%, you'll like this one, 12% thought that Joan of Arc uh, was married to Noah. And 50% of high school seniors, when they did the study, 50% of high school seniors thought that Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. Yeah, that's right. Are we reading the Bible? Better yet, do we know how to read the Bible? Where do we begin when we are reading the Bible? So I, I, I want to take just a few moments to talk uh, about or give you some practical ideas about how we go about reading the Bible uh, that hopefully can be helpful. Uh, and the first is this. This is the first thing they teach you in seminary about interpreting the Bible. Uh, you never interpret the Bible in light of one verse. What you do is you interpret the verse in light of the entirety of the Bible. Does that make sense? Now, how do we go about doing that? Because that's, that's a, little, a little hard to get at. But as a Christian, the best way to go about doing that is, is reading the Bible through the lens of Jesus. After all, Jesus is the Word of God. When, when that phrase is used in the New Testament, it almost always is referring to Jesus, not to Scripture. Jesus is the Word of God. So, if, and, and Jesus uh, taught us that, uh, what were the two greatest commandments? Love God, love others as yourself. And said that all of the law and all of the prophets... In other words, all of the scriptures hang on that. So how do I read scripture? You start with that. Reading it through Jesus' teachings. Uh, reading it through uh, the greatest of Jesus' teachings, the Sermon on the Mount. Use that as your reference. But... Always remember as you are reading the Bible that it is written by many different human beings from many different time periods, from many different cultures, and they had their own ideas of God. Many people, non-believers who want to disprove the Bible, and, and, and some well-meaning believers want to read the Bible as straight history. Straight history understood by how we do history, 21st century Westerners. That, you know, you, you deal with just facts that, that are reported right at the time of their happening. That's how you do history. That's the correct way you do it. Well, that may be how we do it. That's not how everybody in the world does it. It's certainly not how biblical writers did it. Most of the writings you read in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, that, you want, that are, you're tempted to read as straight history, uh, was reported hundreds, many centuries later. And the authors were much more uh, interested in framing and, and making, shaping history than in how we do history of reporting it. So as you come to read the Bible, align your expectations with the Bible as an ancient text. Let go of how you think things should be. Submit yourself to God. When you try to fit the Bible into our understanding of 
history, our notion of history, you are trying to make God submit to you. And you end up robbing the Bible of a lot of its power. And you miss out on a lot of amazing things. So a better way of of when you come to the Bible, instead of thinking in terms of of straight history like we do in, in, in the Western world oftentimes, think in terms of what Linda was talking about in her children's sermon. How did she start that children's sermon? Do you have a favorite story? Think in terms of story. The biblical writers are amazing storytellers. That is what they excel at. And they're telling us the story of God. Just like Linda was talking with Grace about. What do people want to hear when they come to hear a sermon? They want to hear facts? They want to hear history? No, it's the stories. That's what people want to hear. Why is that? Because we can relate to stories. We learn from stories. We remember stories. Stories move us deeply. Do facts move us deeply? Do numbers move us deeply? Ah, textbooks, they move us deeply. (laughs) Stories remain fresh and relevant. They cut across all time and all culture. Can we say the same about history? Does it remain fresh? And it continue to speak to us. So what does God, God give us? God gives us stories. The Bible tells us the story of God's relationship to all of creation, to all of God's people, and gives us a clear picture of God's love. That's the story. And this story is told through Many wonderful, and to be honest, wonderfully bizarre at times people in a myriad of different situations in their lives. Have you ever heard the the acronym, the Bible acronym, uh, B-I-B-L-E, that it stands for uh, Basics and Instructions Before Leaving Earth? Have you heard that one before? You know, it's a a nice acronym. I I don't mean to belittle it, and it's, it's appropriate in certain places, but... The Bible is not a one-size-fits-all, plug-and-play instruction manual. It's not. The Bible does a much better job of showing us what a life of faith is through these wonderful and wonderfully bizarre individuals. We don't all relate to the same people, do we? So the Bible gives us all sorts of people to relate to. Why read the Bible? Well, the passage in 2 Timothy tells us it's inspired. It's inspired by God. This this. Again, these stories continue to speak to us. They continue to be relevant to us. They're they're not limited by time or culture. And so they remain useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And when we read the Bible, when you continue to read about all these marvelous, wonderful people, Wonderfully bizarre at times. It will equip us. It will make us proficient for every good work. Because we've seen it modeled before us in the stories that the Bible tells us. Where's the best place to start reading the Bible? 
Well, actually, the smallest Bible in the world tells us. The Gospels. Start with the Gospels. I don't care which one. Let's pick one. Uh, we want why the Gospels. Well, if we're going to read the scriptures through the light of Jesus Christ, we need to start where it talks about the word of God, where it focuses on who Jesus is, and that is the Gospels. And then enjoy it. Let the story of God's redemptive love fill your life. And know this. When you have questions or you just want to talk about the Bible, my door is always open. I love having those discussions and would welcome them. Amen. And now we'll call, uh, we do have ushers. That's awesome. I'll call the ushers to come forward now to receive our gifts to God. Please pray with me. God, we gratefully present these gifts and entrust them to your work in this world. May our gifts share the, the story of your love to those who are in need, so that your love may abound in the flourishing of every living thing you have created. Amen. And now, together, let's confess what we believe. Heaven and earth declare God's glory. The sky proclaims the work of God's hand. Day and night bear witness to the creator. They speak without words to all who are wise. Lord, our God, how majestic is your name throughout the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. When we look up at the skies, at what your fingers made, the sun and moon and the stars that you set in place? What are human beings that you think about them? What are human beings that you pay attention to them? Yet you've made us only slightly less than divine. You've given us wisdom and understanding. You've given us your instruction and a capacity for faith. You bless us with the ability to know you and trust you. Your instruction is perfect, and your commandments are wise. How majestic is your name throughout the earth. Please be seated.
My name is Linda Dunlevy. I'm one of the deacons here at Westminster. If your name last name starts with a C or a U, I am your deacon. Um, does anyone have any prayers or concerns of concerns or joy that they would like me to add to the list this morning that we'll be praying? Okay. Um, I would ask that we keep the family of Shirley Nysus in our thoughts and prayers as Bill um, joined God in heaven this week. All right, please do the responsive prayer with me. Eternal God, just as you have called people throughout the Bible, you call us to lives of love and justice, breaking down barriers that divide, building bridges of cooperation, peace, and beloved community. As we remember the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. this week, we pray for the day when all God's children can be free. We pray for the day your children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. We pray for the day when hate and violence and bigotry are overpowered by love and peace and acceptance. Let justice roll down like waters, holy God, and righteousness ever like a ever flowing stream. God of grace, bless us with peace. Holy God, hear the prayers of your people as global wars rage and gun violent desecrates protect the innocent and help us prioritize efforts of peace. God of grace, bless us with peace. In the face of political polarization, help us listen more, seek understanding, and approach those with whom we disagree with curiosity, humility, and openness. Help us listen for the story beneath others' stories. God of grace, bless us with peace. In the face of fear and anxiety, pressure and provocation, help us find in you a refuge and strength, a steadfast support in times of trial. Remind us, holy God, we are not alone. O oh God of grace, bless us with peace. Bless those who are suffering, ill and grieving. Bless those who feel weak and worn down by our world. We pray especially for those on our prayer list. Brad Hashi, Rachel Wagner, Jim Farmer, Noreen Johnson, David Owen, Cheryl Hillbrand, Austin, Teresa Bieber, Eileen Cardwell, Bill Wilson, Trista, Shelley Taylor, Eddie McKinnon, Donald Mudloff, Jordan Burkharf, Jenna Anderson, Jane Hunt, Carol Hanwork, Jordan Hout, Stacy and Jeff Bortz, and Tracy Bertina. O oh God of grace, bless us with peace. United as the holy body of Christ, we lift these prayers to you, Savior God. Hear us now as we pray the prayer that Christ taught us together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Please stand if you are able as we sing our closing hymn, uh, Break Thou the Bread of Life.
Each week as we face our doubts, every day as you face your doubts, the charge remains the same. Trust God. Can we learn to trust God in the face of uncertainty? Receive now your blessing. May God's redemptive love fill your life. May Christ Jesus, the storyteller, Become our living word. And may the Holy Spirit give you strength to face uncertainty. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. The time has come, O Lord, for us to leave this place. Guide us and protect us. Fellowship once again.